Good morning, Michigan. A marvelous Monday to you. It's Michael Patrick Shields, heard all across the state of Michigan. Coach D'Antonio, the voice you just heard, will join us later in the program. He's the Michigan State football coach. And a lot of the uh, Big Ten schools have already had their spring football game, but Michigan State's will be this weekend on Saturday in the afternoon, and we'll find out why he wanted to have it so late and what they've been up to and really what the chances are for the Spartans this year to contend for the Big Ten title. That's uh, coming up later in the program. Speaking of Big Ten titles, Stacey Slobodnik Stoll's Michigan State University women's golf team has won the Big Ten championship for the first time since 2007. They did it Sunday on Easter at Lakeshore Country Club in Glencoe, Illinois. And uh, she'll be with us a little bit later in the program to explain how she did that. It's uh, eight minutes after the hour right now. And uh, we're going to talk politics this morning, too, as we usually do, because politics is our family business. Ed Sarpolis is going to join us from Target Insights. We've got a lot of things to talk with him about now that uh, we're looking at uh, the countdown to the budget deadline. It's not really a deadline. It's a self-imposed deadline that Governor Snyder has implemented. He wants everything to be done and finished by early June. But uh, not everything is nearly ironed out yet. I'm told there was a lot of action at the Capitol last week, late last week, in fact. But uh, Ed Sarpolis is with us right now from Target Insights. Good morning to you. Good morning to you, sir. Is it true there was a lot of movement uh, at the Capitol last week? <laughs> well, if you consider sweeping the, the leaves, yes, probably. But Well, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes going on on the yeah. budget and, and bills and legislation. But, uh, but in essence, uh, that's primarily what's going on uh, down, down there, trying to negotiate the budget. Um, let me, let's go through some of these things, if I can, and just sort of get your take. Um, the Associated Press, Tim Martin, kind of laid it all out here. Uh, this uh, budget uh, deadline that Rick Snyder has imposed, he wants it done by May 31st. Sometimes it's stretched all the way into October, and, uh, but he wants it done early, in dog years, okay? Right? And so part of the process, people would presume that, well, he's got a Republican House, he's got a Republican Senate, this ought to be easy. But it's not necessarily that easy, is it? No, it's not. Well, what's happening here is, is that, especially in the Senate, more than the State House, they realize that they have constituents back home that they have to go and say, yeah. here's what I did for you. Here's what I, the bacon I brought home. And under Governor Snyder's budget, there is no bacon to take home. It's an empty sack. And, you know, as an elected official, Republican or Democrat, you're not going to go home and face the heat uh, to the voters that you depend upon for fundraising and for votes uh, uh, in the fall of November of 12 or 14. Governor Snyder surely knows that, and uh, while he may not care about re getting reelected, they do. The senators and representatives. Well, they do. The other thing is that you have a you have a mature a base of senators, uh, returning senators, uh, the, the returning five Republicans: Senator Kahn, Senator Richard Ville, uh, Jansen, Papa George, and, and Mike Knopf. They've been around the block. You know, they understand that they've been elected to like the governor, and they have much. They were much more seasoned, and mm -hmm. they understand what their belief of what their vision of. Michigan would be, and many of them, if they had given up, they would have run for governor themselves. So they have their own opinions. They're not freshmen. They actually have beliefs of what they think the, the state of Michigan should be. Uh, the governor, let's take education, K through 12 schools, for instance. He wants a per student reduction of $300. That's in addition to the $170 per student that was already in place when he took office. Uh, the uh, House and the Senate, I guess, are fairly close. They might want to temper that just a little bit. Who's going to win? Because the Democrats are saying they're going to send uh, those kind of cuts would put Michigan schools into insolvency. Well, they're, they're already seeing some of that already. It's the, the state has already avoided trying to uh, take over some of the schools, trying to stretch that through. I would say you're probably going to come closer to the Senate version of not just having such deep cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to remember is, is you have a lot of parents out there. They're not necessarily you know, Democrats or labor women like that. They're just parents in schools, and their voters are or senior citizens. You're going to see much more closer to uh, what the House and Senate do, maybe more leaning towards the Senate on, on these cuts in education, because these are people who they have to face, the parents, the kids, and you don't want your school back home closing uh, at all, because that's, that's your pride and joy. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about universities then, also the pride and joy. The uh, governor wants to cut uh, individual aid to individual universities by 15 percent. Some of them, like Eastern Michigan University, would be more like 20 percent. The Senate apparently agree, agrees, and uh, the uh, House is proposing some 14% uh, for <laughs> one less percent. Everybody's worried that uh, the uh, colleges would then just simply raise tuition, and that would be too expensive for some people. But there are penalties built in, too, if uh, the colleges raise the tuition too much. 
Well, what's going to happen is is, is that uh, I would say K-12 uh, the, will have a priority of higher ed. They'll try to accommodate higher ed where they can. On the issue of uh, universities raising their tuition, they will, they, will, they will do what makes good business sense. They'll attempt to live within the budget constraints provided by the governor uh, and the legislature. But in the end, especially the, the bigger universities like Michigan State, U of M, and who are, are quite dependent on out-of-state students paying much more than our in-state students, they'll continue to take more out-of-state students uh, and basically reduce the number of students they take within the state. So in the end, it's going to come down to a business decision by the university. We're going to get a uh, four-year uh, uh, sort of limit, a deadline on welfare payments? Well, that's something we're still debating, and, and that's something was what's quite surprised me in this one here. Um, uh, ex, uh, Gilda Jacobs has, has done a very good job uh, helping human services division saying, hey, look at here, the, the more people you take off some of these, uh, these benefits, the more you create unemployment, the more they've become dependent on the state and other services. So I think there might be some accommodation. How much, we don't know yet, because you've got to remember, you start to eliminate some cuts, and you got to find out how you're going to pay for these cuts. So the question is, what's going to be the priority? Education, uh, aid to the, the people who are unemployed or the poor. We have yet to see that sorted out, and I think that's what you're beginning to see this week. Hmm. Um, it seems, from what I'm reading here, the Senate and the House, uh, they don't seem to mind the uh, four-year limit, but they want even more reductions in some areas, and they also want, as you say, some leniency in certain cases. Um, retiree income taxes, that started off as a, a big slash for everyone, and the, uh, from what, it, what I could tell, the uh, governor sort of uh, thought twice about that based on the uh, recommendations of the House and the Senate. Well, first of all, there's no way, especially since senior votes, and you have a lot of senior citizens, especially in Republican districts, who do go out and vote, they're contributors, they're active in the party, there's no way that Republicans could go back home and tell their seniors were their taxes are going to be raised. There might be some accommodation on some caps or maybe one who pays what. I think in the end there might be some of that. Uh, but in the end, there's no way that uh, they, they could go back home and face the heat or, or the marches are coming to their district. Um, one way or another, it looks like uh, the business owners are going to get some sort of break. We'll talk about that when we get back with Ed Sarpolis from uh, Target Insights. Also, we're going to talk with Ed about the redistricting that's coming and whether or not this idea of a recall of Governor Snyder could have any legs. It's Michael Patrick Shields all across Michigan. Michael Patrick Shields all across Michigan. Mark D'Antonio, the Michigan State football coach, will join us a little later. We're talking politics with Ed Sarpolis, the founder of Target Insights. And we're getting around to this complicated matter. I think it's complicated anyway of uh, the governor's uh, budget proposal. And really, when we get down to business tax, um, the, apparently the governor wants to replace the complex Michigan business tax with a 6% income tax applied to corporations with shareholders. A lot of tax exemptions would be eliminated or phased out. And his plan overall, as we understand it, uh, with reporting from the AP, would reduce taxes on businesses by about a billion dollars over the next year and 1.7 the following year, and a scheduled rollback of the state's personal income tax rate from 4.35 to 4.25 would be delayed. Have you got all that? Well, the lawmakers are still sifting through uh, changes made to Snyder's plan, and uh, there seems to be no clear alternative is the way that the, this story reports it, Ed Sarpolis. Is, is that the case? Is that what you know? Well, that's pretty much where it's at. Well, what you're finding happening now is, is that there's beginning to see some movement on, you know, the government want to eliminate a lot of these mega credits or, or MADC credits. What we're finding is, is that there's some give back on, okay, what do we need on brownfield credits? I'm recapturing some things. You have a lot of redevelopment going on in urban cores like Detroit or Pontiac or other cities around the state. Yeah. And so what you're finding out here, the other thing that's complicating things is now since they're going to, there's some sense of pulling back on the cuts in education, the, the pension tax. Uh, well, if you if you keep cutting business and you're you're reducing the uh, you know the burden on senior citizens in schools, something has to give. I think what you see happening here is is that he's going to stick to his plan on simplifying the system, reducing the MBT. The question is is will it be six percent tax? Will it be seven? or will there be some level of, uh, of credits? And I think that's what you've seen to play out here, some balance somewhere in the middle, uh, because the, the bottom line is, is that, uh, you know, we still need to balance all the interest groups. And you're seeing what Snyder did not expect is that being a businessman, business rules here in Michigan, but at the same time, is he has to be accountable to the voters and the people who uh, represent them. 
Um, let's talk about, lastly, the film incentives now. The governor says we can have a $25 million program for movies and film incentives that cuts and caps, really, the amount that uh, was handed out in the past, the 43% rebate. The Senate says we ought to cap it at $10 million, and the House says eliminate it altogether. What's likely to happen? I think whoever has the biggest uh, war chest of funds uh, <laughs> to affect the outcome of this, and we have yet to see the big players uh, kick in their funds like you're seeing in, in, in the bridge proposals. And but I think I in thought... the end we're going to see some kind of balancing act here. But uh, I think unless there's much more uh, lobbying going on and uh, the big players in the play get behind the scenes is that something will play out. In the end, the governor's going to get most of what he wants on that, that issue. The other thing we haven't talked about is that uh, we have the May Revenue Conference coming up, and there's some potential of an additional $500 million that the legislature didn't know it may potentially have to play with. And so... When you and I are talking, it might change here in a couple of weeks when mm. the elected officials say, hey, we got more money than we thought. We found some money. Kind of yeah. like when you you know, you pull your pants out of the dryer and there was a 20 in your pocket that you didn't yeah, know about. Yeah, so you and I talking about what may or may not happen may change here in a couple of weeks. The governor is supposed to give an address this week on education, as I understand it. Um, what are you hearing about the, uh, if at anything, about the uh, teachers' vote? Did they vote in large part to uh, authorize a strike if need be? That is still unknown. There's yeah. a mixed thing. Is, is you, you, what's going to come down is the teachers, you know, are very key about protecting their children in the classroom, doing their work, and that uh, the, the question of taking a strike would come down to is, is that is, do they really feel that the governor legislature is totally ignoring education, hurting the kids in the classroom, and impacting the quality of education? That's what they decide on the vote. And I don't know what the vote has is, but that's where the focus is going to be is, what is good for kids in the classroom? That's how the teachers will have voted for a strike or not. There's a group called Michigan Citizens United, and they filed paperwork to approve the language to try to have a recall of Governor Snyder. What what chance do they have? I guess they got to get something like 806,000 valid signatures. Yeah, what's going to happen there is, is where is the bodies, where is the money to collect all the signatures? Is it possible to collect signatures? Yes. Uh, is there enough people out there to sign a petition of 800,000? Yes, the question is, is how do you gather them, how do you organize them? And it's very interesting that uh, Labor and the Democratic Party, which you assume would be behind this, has been playing low-key, at least the leadership side on this. Hmm. And so the question would be, is, is that this group is looking to call Snyder. Where are the troops? Where are the volunteers? Where's the funds coming to pull this off? I mean, obviously it can be done. It's been done in the past. The question is, is, is that uh, where, where's the bodies and where's the funds to pay for this? When are we going to start hearing about the redistricting? Well, it's already started. Uh, we've had a couple hearings in the state house. The Senate has yet to hear that. Uh, tomorrow uh, at the state house, uh, Representative Lunn and his redistricting committee will be taking testimony on min minority majority uh, voting rights districts. Uh, um, uh, at, uh, yesterday, I put out with mirrors, uh, my mirrors news, as I put out some example majority minority districts of the state house. Today, we're looking at releasing some example maps of congressional district majority minority so the, the lines are already being drawn they're already being decided upon debated upon mm -hmm. and we are hearing testimony and i would say as soon as the budget winds down a little bit here you're going to see some visible plans coming out here and some potential votes i mean they're, they want to get out of here as soon as possible uh, especially on redistricting too as well as the budget because you got to remember redistricting is just as volatile in budget because some reps and senators may not have a district mm -hmm. they may not be coming back and then also you got political foray going on this is that uh, we call political gerrymandering who gets the upper hand on drawing the district who uh, among the congressional delegation is is most likely to get the rug pulled out from under them well, it's a, well the bottom line most people assume that in order to make two majority minority congressional districts that a portion of Congressman Sandy Levin's district will have to be used over 8 Mile Road. That's the likely scenario. But in my drawings, which will be coming out uh, tomorrow in mirrors, is the fact is that uh, you don't have to hurt Sandy Levin as much as you think. You could actually uh, uh, include uh, the Cotter's district with Conyers. You could include Congressman John Dingell. You could take portions of other districts. So the bottom line, Congressman Levin is probably the most impacted by any line drawing oh. uh, coming down. Okay, we'll look forward to that, and uh, we sure appreciate the time so early this morning, Ed Sarpolis. We'll talk to you soon. You. Ed Sarpolis, the founder of Target Insights and uh, widely known as the uh, chief pollster in the state of Michigan and political analyst, too. Uh, Mark D'Antonio joins us later. What happened with that pastor in Dearborn on Friday? We'll get an update and where he goes next. Right after this, it's Michael Patrick Shields all across Michigan. Gary Austin is our anchor man, and it's time for the Answer Man segment. 
I'm putting on the Answer Man hat right now. If you're watching on Fox 47 television, or if you're, uh, you can see it on YouTube or at michigantalknetwork.com. It uh, provides me all the wisdom I need to fend off any of the questions from Gary Austin, the petitioner. Good morning to you, sir. Well, good morning. I'm going to do my best to stump you here. The Answer Man is brought to you by... Well, AmericanMetalRoofs.com. And you can check out a terrific website. AmericanMetalRoofs.com is the website address, or you can call them 877-569-4700. Very good, sir. What is your question? Number Remember, one. I've never been wrong. Not I once. I, and as try as I might to stump you, I, I fail. It's because my wisdom time. doesn't always come from the east. Sometimes it comes from part south. Wherever, and it, wherever it comes, it's working for it. That MPS has an answer for everything. That's what they say. Okay, here we go. What is your question? Number one, officials at Missouri's Lambert St. Louis International Airport, they hope to get more flights in the air today. What happened over the past few days that caused such Don't a such a fuss at that big airport? There's no sun up in the sky, stormy weather. Yes, you absolutely like that? right. A that tornado good? Friday. Well, that's a, I mean, tornadoes are rough anywhere they hit. You yeah. hit an airport. Well, that causes all sorts of problems. And it sure did over the past few days. However, officials there in St. Louis hope to get things back to normal sometime today. All righty. Hey, guess what? It's costing us more to fill up our tanks. That's nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, the question I have for you is, on average, nationwide, what are we paying to fill up a, a tank? Uh, regular no it's right around 388, isn't it? <laughs> you're absolutely not right around. You're right on target. Thank 388 is the exact number answer, man. You're two for two. Chicago's got it bad. They got the highest in the continental U.S. Hawaii's the highest overall. Hmm. I tell you, it just keeps going up and up. Five Next question. By summertime is what we're told. All right. Donald Trump, mm -hmm. he's turning to his celebrity apprentice contestants for what kind of advice? What kind of advice here? Is you is or is you ain't my baby? Should I run for president or not? Yes, he's asking for Boy, he's really playing it out, isn't he? <laughs> he sure That's is. Something. But, but uh... <laughs> Could we expect any less from Donald Trump? Nah, he's that. a showman. And so is Gary Austin. So I've done it again perfectly unscathed this morning. And the answer man window is closed. Thank you, Gary Austin. Uh, we are going to talk about that pastor in Dearborn and whether or not he's still going to protest and how it's all going to shake out. There's a lawsuit involved now, too. That's coming in just a few minutes right here with Michael Patrick Shields. It's a pure Michigan Monday all across the state of Michigan. Michael Patrick Shields with you here live in our American Metal Roof studio in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building right across from the baseball stadium just a couple blocks from the Capitol where all the action is, but not always all the action. There was going to be some action as I understood it. That was going to be Friday, Good Friday, uh, in Dearborn there at the, um, um, the Islamic Center of America. You know the story by now, surely you know. Anyway, that uh, Pastor Jones, who uh, threatened to uh, burn the Quran on 9-11, got worldwide attention for it, is getting worldwide attention again because he wanted to have a protest outside the Islamic Center. Apparently, uh, he, had a, he was going to bring a gun, and he told everyone he was going to do that, and everybody said, uh-oh. So the next thing you know, he was arrested, and then uh, they went to a jury, and a jury said, you know, uh, if you're going to have that uh, protest, it's very likely that there is going to be some violence. And so now the price tag for security for Pastor Terry Jones estimated at more than $46,000 and likely to increase this week. Uh, one Detroit TV station says $31,000 has already been spent on police preparing for a protest that turned into that trial on Friday. And uh, so where do we go from here? He says he's going to sue. And... Uh, Brian Rooney, our old friend, the uh, constitutional attorney and a deputy director of the Department of Human Services, uh, was recently with uh, the uh, group that is going to help out Pastor Terry Jones, as we understand, the Thomas More Law Center in Ann Arbor. Good morning, Mr. Rooney. Good morning, Michael Patrick. How are you? Okay. Did I summarize that fairly well, that uh, he wanted to have the protest and the city kind of shut him down? And uh, where do we go from here? What happened? said uh, I'm no longer with the Thomas More Law Center, but if they in fact are going to represent them, then they'll most likely, the first thing they'll do is file a complaint in uh, the Eastern District of Michigan Federal Court on First Amendment grounds, and um, then uh, the city will have to respond and we'll go from there, and then a federal district judge will, will make a decision one way or the other. 
Uh, apparently, he's going to stage a protest this Friday now. It's going to be at Dearborn City Hall, though, instead of at the Islamic Center of America. What's the what's the distinction? Why why would he do that instead of going ahead with his plan to go to the Islamic Center? Do you know, or what what do you speculate? That makes a little more sense in the sense that uh, you know, private property, you don't have a right to protest there. No, you know that there's private property rights, but there are things known as traditional public forum, whether they're um, public sidewalks or city halls um, that people have traditionally been allowed to speak freely at public parks, those sorts of things. Cities can put, cities, towns, counties can put you know, reasonable time, place, restriction, manner, restrictions on them. But uh, typically you can't in traditional public forums where you know, people have always been allowed to speak publicly and freely. And so I imagine moving from the uh, religious center to, which is probably private property, to a public property place is uh, why he's doing it. Not nearly as sensational, though, is it? Oh, no. But, you know, this guy obviously goes after the sensational headlines, and so the, the, the press likes to follow him, and I'm sure they'll <laughs> follow him there, too. He says that he was arrested for something he hadn't done, and he finds that outrageous, and that's why he's gone to the Thomas More Law Center for a, a possible lawsuit, as you mentioned, on First Amendment grounds. I mean, he, he, he may have a case there, mightn't he? Yeah, you know, if he was, in fact, arrested for, you know, thinking about going to the Islamic Center, that's, you know, not something you're supposed to be able to arrest somebody on. Uh, and the jury saying that he might have caused a disruption is not what our constitution our constitutional uh, framework's all about i mean you know if we had juries deciding whether somebody's going to cause a, a a ruckus or not then none of martin luther king's junior marches in the south or in the north even would have been allowed to happen but thank god they did well, we'll see what happens next, I guess. There, uh, obviously, we're going to have a potential lawsuit, and he's going to try it at the, uh, at the uh, Dearborn City Hall instead of the Islamic Center. But um, one thing is, you're right, he's got our attention, and we're curious to see what happens next. And so we appreciate you taking the call. Congratulations on the new gig, by the way, appointed by the governor, as I understand, Deputy Director of the Department of Human Services. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It's very exciting to be part of reforming welfare in Michigan. Well, the one-time candidate uh, for Congress, now uh, working for Governor Snyder here in the state capitol, and uh, his efforts will have an effect all across the state. Travel safely, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, Michael Patrick. Brian Rooney, I, I, you know, I should have asked him, what's the deal this weekend with the uh, NFL draft and the Steelers, and is there going to be a season next year and all that sort of thing? But we'll leave that for another time because it's another topic, and I don't want to surprise him there. As you know, he's a board member of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and his family owns the Steelers, the famous Rooney family. And uh, so Brian Rooney will be curious to see. Now the NFL lockout is still going on, so they're going to have a draft anyway. And as I understand it, you can't negotiate with the players before the draft or I think even after the draft because of the lockout situation. Let's hope they get that settled. I wouldn't want to be without the NFL this year, would you? Governor Snyder, speaking of him, his second-floor Romney Building office is getting refitted with new bulletproof glass. I guess they just uh, thought the seals were kind of giving way around the old glass, and so uh, they're going to be replacing two windows facing Capitol Avenue and three overlooking Michigan Avenue. A lot of people think the governor's office is in the Capitol building. He's got a ceremonial office there, but his real office is across the street. So it's going to cost $38,000, apparently, to uh, fix up these windows for him so he's safe and sound there in, the, uh, in his office building. There is a uh, lone Republican in the Hawaii State Senate. Pretty sensational stuff here. Uh, you know, the question about whether President Obama was born in Hawaii, born in the United States, Donald Trump saying, why won't he show his birth certificate? Instead, he shows a certificate of live birth. Well, this uh, state senator says the real issue, the real reason President Obama doesn't want to release his long-form birth certificate is because he's got something to hide, and that is the name of his actual birth father. And uh, he says uh, Obama was probably born in Hawaii, but the real issue is not the birth certificate, but what's on it. And it could have to do with the name on the birth certificate, who is actually listed as the father and the citizenship of the father. And uh, he, he, too, like Donald Trump, can't understand why he would want to keep the 
um, birth certificate hidden, and maybe that's why. Um, gas prices, as you heard earlier, continue uh, to spiral, but uh, Trilby Lundberg, the uh, survey editor, says we may have peaked. We may have peaked because there's a decrease in demand for gas now as people are being a little choosier about where they drive, and there's a slow in the rise of crude oil prices. So maybe all that talk you've been seeing, that scare, scary talk about 5 and $6 a gallon, maybe that won't come to fruition. Stay tuned for more. Holland Manda locked up. He was arrested twice in the same night. Uh, they picked up uh, Fu Van Mai was his name. He was on an outstanding warrant. He pretended he was sick, and the officer rolled down the window in the car so he could get some air, and he jumped out through the window and ran off. So they had to catch him again and charge him with escape. And a woman couldn't help herself. She loved shoes so much in Kalamazoo that she uh, broke into a business, and police said, hey, what's that door doing open at this hour? And a 46-year-old ran out with a big bag of shoes. She tried to escape on a bicycle. She's going to be charged with breaking and entering. And Remember Imelda Marcos had something like 4,000 pairs of shoes? And this lady had a bag full and was trying to make a getaway. The sports story is coming next. It's Michael Patrick Shields all across Michigan. Michael Patrick Shields with you all across Michigan this morning. A man with a knife has tried to hijack an Alitalia flight from Paris to Rome. It happened last night while you slept, uh, demanding to be flown to Libya. He was quickly overpowered and arrested, and the plane landed, according to uh, witnesses and officials. Thanks to the prompt intervention of attendants, the aggressor was immobilized, kept in his seat, and the flight continued on to Rome. They say he pulled out a small knife... And some people are saying that it was actually a nail clipper to the throat of a female flight attendant and held her for a few minutes. And uh, they didn't identify the passenger. Italian media, though, says he's a 48-year-old citizen of Kazakhstan who worked in Paris. All 131 passengers aboard the plane disembarked safely in Rome. And did he have a, a knife or did he have a nail clipper? is the, is the uh, sort of question there. A lot of people were probably nervous, probably praying, and there's a new study. They uh, polled 18,829 people, Reuters did, asking them if they believe in God. This was across 23 countries, by the way. And 51% uh, of people believe in a divine entity, 18% don't, 17% are undecided. And the uh, places that have the highest proportion of people with a definitive belief in God Indonesia, Turkey, and Brazil. Uh, only 10% of Russians believe in God, according to this poll. It is uh, 14 now before the hour. Michael Patrick Shields heard all across the state of Michigan. We are in our uh, American Metal Roof studio in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building, just a couple blocks from the Capitol, right here on the Avenue of Michigan. And Pat Gillespie, the guy who created this building and create lots of other cool buildings in Detroit, I mean, in uh, Lansing and Plans, for more, even still, is on the other end of our line right now. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael Patrick. How are you? Good. I was uh, thinking of you yesterday when I saw this Associated Press story in the Detroit News about uh, urban development experts and local officials trying to preserve the brownfield credits in Michigan, and it occurred to me that you might be one of them. Uh, first of all, what's a brownfield credit? And number two, uh, are you worried that uh, some of those credits could go away? Well, yeah, first of all, we are worried. The, the governor has said that uh, most of them, if not all of them, are going to go away. And basically, a brownfield credit is something that's being used around the state right now to clean up um, urban sites that have been sitting a long time that are uh, contaminated or blighted or have a building on it that's in such bad repair that it needs to be torn down and a, a new one put up. Um, that's helping spur Detroit, Grand Rapids, Flint, and Lansing, and Kalamazoo. Uh, do many of these projects that are going on. In fact, the building that you're in you know, would not be possible without some type of uh, brownfield credit because the site was contaminated. Um, you know, I'm talking to developers around the state that they're basically going into shutdown because they don't know what's going to happen. And these, uh, this urban stuff's really going to come to a slowdown or a stop unless this gets uh, you know, reapproved to continue to use these tools. It sounds like a, like a one-two punch. On one hand, you won't have development, and on the other hand, we'll be stuck with these uh, you know, uninhabitable, blighted sites. Well, that's exactly it, especially a state like Michigan that's had such a manufacturing uh, base of history. A lot of that stuff has gone away, and these buildings don't have any other use um, other than to be torn down and rehabbed, or you know, they definitely need to be cleaned up. So you know, it's not good environmentally as, as well. You know, that brownfield credit helps clean up a lot of these sites. 
these sites are just left to sit there with you know, petroleum products and other stuff in the ground. It's not going to help the surrounding properties either. So it's a ripple effect, you know, not just a new building, but also cleaning up uh, the, the sites and the sites around it as well. Do you have any pending uh, brownfield projects? We actually have two projects we're working on that we've basically uh, mothballed until all this happen, uh, all this gets figured out. And right now, it's, it's not looking real good. So I know other developers around the state are also basically at a standstill. So a lot of the momentum that's been happening over the last five years has really come to a screeching halt. It's, it's kind of scary because Michigan was on a little bit of a roll as far as this uh, urban redevelopment. Uh, it was the accident fund a brownfield project? Yeah, I mean, just look around Lansing. If you know Lansing, in the last five years, there's been the accident fund, uh, motor wheel lofts, Pruden lofts, mm -hmm. stadium district, uh, the Arbaugh building, Christman's new headquarters, and not one of those would have happened without these credits. Skyline would look dramatically different. So it's a very important credit um, for developers to just have a chance to uh, get them going financially. It do you get the sense that uh, you're being heard in the governor's office, you and the others who want to protect some of these uh, brownfield tax credits? I'm not sure. Some days uh, you hear something like uh, they're listening, but you know they are pretty focused on, on uh, cutting. And they're pretty focused on their plan, which is you know just to lower business taxes as a whole. But you know, just doing that does not get these sites cleaned up and new buildings on it. So um, I don't know. One week I'm optimistic and one week I'm not. Right now I'm about neutral. I don't know where it's going. Mm. That's a big part of your business plan, though, isn't it? Well, you know, our plan was to focus on urban core yep. and uh, try to make the biggest difference we can in these downtowns. But without that, it's definitely going to have to shift. And I think you're going to see a lot of the suburban sprawl that happened in the 80s go on because you know, it's easier to develop in a, a greenfield site without contamination. So the developers are probably going to go to the path of least resistance where there's less problems in the soil and you know, the, the suburbs will, will probably win. Mm, that way I've heard uh, Mayor Bernero talk a number of times about the hole in the donut, and uh, that's sort of what you're talking about, that people go f head for the exits and leave the cities in disarray. That's exactly what will happen. Okay, let's hope it doesn't come to that then from your standpoint. We sure appreciate the chat this morning. Great, thanks. Pat Gillespie, the president of the Gillespie Group, who has all sorts of brownfield plans, and it is a one-two punch, isn't it? We'll still have contaminated sites uh, with nothing on them, but all it takes is money. Uh, we will talk with uh, Michigan State football coach Mark D'Antonio coming up later in the program and Stacy Slobodnik Stoll, who is the coach of the uh, Michigan State women's basketball team. They won the Big Ten championship on Easter Sunday in the Chicago area. That's coming up shortly, too. Tom Walsh will be with us, too, from the Detroit Free Press. He is a big advocate of uh, moving in, get, in, getting cities going, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is one example. They're moving new people into Lansing. They're moving people into downtown Detroit and, of course, Grand Rapids, too. So stay tuned for all that. The full sports story. Well, there's a new number one ranked golfer in the world. We'll tell you who that is and how the Tigers do over the weekend. Stay tuned. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Welcome to your Monday. It's a uh, pure Michigan Monday. We're live here in our American Metal Roofs studio. You can find them at AmericanMetalRoofs.com, and you can find Pure Michigan, well, everywhere you're listening to me in the state of Michigan right now. The Detroit Lions, you know, they're going to have an NFL draft this week, Thursday and Friday. And uh, even though there's a work stoppage in the NFL, they're still going to have the draft. And the Lions are not going to draft a quarterback. Uh, they say they don't need to. They've got Matthew Stafford. Now, Matthew Stafford, the big money guy that they drafted a couple of seasons ago, missed more games than he's played. Missed 19, played 13. But the Lions have confidence. His injury problems are behind him. Let's hope so. And they feel confident with him leading the franchise into next season. And here's what uh, Martin Mayhew, the Lions general manager, says, quote, I'm putting all my eggs into the Matthew Stafford, Sean Hill, Drew Stanton basket. Okay, they're not even going to interview a quarterback in the draft. Are you happy with that? Matthew Stafford, Sean Hill, and Drew Stanton. Rich Kincaid, well, we don't know how often we're going to hear that song, if at all, but the draft will be this week. Rich Kincaid is covering the Tigers all weekend. How did they fare against the Chicago White Sox, Rich? Max Scherzer, the story for the Tigers yesterday, Michael Patrick, as Detroit completed a three-game weekend sweep of the Chicago White Sox with their second consecutive shutout 3-0 over the White Sox. Scherzer working eight innings of four-hit ball. 
The Tigers, since they started the season 3-7, and seven, there was great wailing and gnashing of teeth as they were at that point on pace to lose 113 games. And I know I was one of the people doing the gnashing and the wailing. They've really turned things around. Since that start, the Tigers have gone 8-3. and three. In the weekend series against Chicago, the Tigers outscored the White Sox 21-3. to three. They're on a roll right now. They're off today. They open a three-game series against Seattle at Comerica Park on Tuesday, then a weekend shutdown against the Central Division leading Cleveland Indians in Cleveland. Yesterday, the Tigers over the White Sox 3-0 at Comerica Park. I'm Rich Kincaid. Back to you, Michael Patrick. Lee Westwood is the new number one ranked player in the world. Luke Donald went to a playoff at uh, Hilton Head Island against Brant Snedeker and lost on the third playoff hole. So that cost Luke Donald the number one spot in the tournament, of course. And that may have been the last ever Harbortown tournament. Michael Patrick Shields all across Michigan. Good morning, Michigan. A very marvelous Monday to you. It's a pure Michigan Monday here in the American Metal Roof Studio in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building, just down the street from Governor Snyder's office. And his second floor Romney Building office is getting refitted with new bulletproof windows. Now, don't get carried away. It's not because there's any special threat to the governor. It's just that apparently the seals around the old glass are getting kind of old. Uh, those windows were put in back in 1989. They are bulletproof as it is, but it's going to be a $38,000 job to replace those five windows, two of them facing Capitol Avenue and three overlooking Michigan Avenue. There are some people taking shots at the governor, not literally, but it's a group called Michigan Citizens United. They filed uh, paperwork across Washtenaw County. They want to recall Governor Snyder. Now, it's not going to be very easy. First of all, they have to get the language approved. And then they have to get 806,522 signatures just to put it to a vote. And they want to get more than a million, and they want to start collecting on May 8th, but it's a huge, huge task for somebody to be able to do that, and it uh, costs money, too, because you've got to hire petition circulators and all that sort of thing. So what will happen next? I don't know. They're riled up uh, because uh, they say the emergency financial manager legislation signed by Snyder that gives managers the power to avoid union contracts is uh, not right, and uh, they want to recall the governor. Now, the governor's got his own work, uh, obviously, sitting on his desk. He wants to get the budget solved by the very end of May. And uh, earlier this morning, I asked Ed Sarpolis, the founder of Target Insights, it, it's not easy, is it, Ed? I mean, even though the governor has a Republican House and a Republican Senate, and he's a Republican, some people might look at the math on that and say, how can the budget be complicated? After all, they're going to cut money to K-12 through schools and universities, and they're going to cut welfare and cut community colleges, and they're going to try to find some savings in the prisons, and they're going to maybe tax some of the income on retirees, and we're going to change the business tax, though, so uh, business people spend less. And then you got the film incentives to deal with. But you would think everybody would say, oh, he's a Republican, we're a Republican. Kumbaya, it doesn't work that way, does it, Ed? No, it's not. Well, what's happening here is, is that, especially in the Senate, more than the State House, they realize that they have constituents back home that they have to go and say, yeah. here's what I did for you. Here's what I, the bacon I brought home. And under Governor Snyder's budget, there is no bacon to take home. It's an empty sack. And, we, you know, as an elect, elected official, Republican or Democrat, you're yeah. not going to go home and face the heat uh, to the voters that you depend upon for fundraising and for votes uh, uh, in the fall of November of 12 or 14. Yeah, now the governor may not care about getting reelected, but the senators and representatives almost certainly do. Um, uh, one of the uh, other areas that seems like it's due to be cut are the brownfield credits. And so urban and development experts and local officials are trying to preserve key elements of what they consider uh, the most important economic program in rebuilding Michigan cities, a tax credit that redevelops areas that at one time were con uh, shuttered factories, old industrial sites, blights, places that you look at and say, wow, that looks awful, and many times it's contaminated as well, but uh, there may be a cut of brownfield credits where they give somebody who's willing to develop that site a tax break. Pat Gillespie is one of those people. In fact, the building we're sitting in right now in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building was a brownfield project. It wouldn't exist if it weren't for those tax credits, and he's got a couple of more. And I talked with him earlier and, and asked him if he was worried about the potential of these cuts to the brownfield credits. Well, yeah, first of all, we are worried. The, the governor has said that uh, most of them, if not all of them, are going to go away. And basically, a brownfield credit is something that's being used around the state right now to clean up um, urban sites that have been sitting a long time that are contaminated or blighted or have a building on it that's such bad repair that it needs to be torn down in a 
a new one put up um, that's helping spur Detroit, Grand Rapids, Flint, Lansing, and Kalamazoo uh, do many of these projects that are going on. In fact, the building that you're in you know, would not be possible without some type of uh, brownfield credit because the site was contaminated. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm talking to developers around the state that they're basically going into shutdown because they don't know what's going to happen, and these uh, this urban stuff's really going to come to a slowdown or a stop. All it takes is money. Eleven minutes after the hour, Michael Patrick Shields, the uh, Florida pastor Terry Jones, and the controversy. He's the one that wanted to burn the Koran on 9/11, and it caused all sorts of trouble worldwide, especially through the Muslim world. And he wanted to protest on Good Friday at the Islamic Center in Dearborn. And he was setting up to do that and was arrested. And then there was a jury trial that said he was going to create a breach of the peace if he protested outside the Islamic Center. And he's saying, wait a minute, how can I be arrested for something I didn't do, I was thinking about doing? And uh, so he is probably going to sue. And, and the group that's going to help him is the Thomas More Law Center uh, out of Ann Arbor. And Brian Rooney, we spoke to earlier this morning, used to work for the Thomas More Law Center. And I asked him, uh, we, you know, he may have a case here, Pastor Jones. What happened? And this is what Brian Rooney told me. We'll get back to uh, Brian Rooney a little bit later. Apparently that tape's not working. Uh, the, uh, what he did say, though, is that he might have a case, and uh, how you go and arrest someone for something they were just thinking about doesn't really make sense. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Also, uh, earlier this morning... Uh, we got a chance to uh, tell you that uh, Rich Rodriguez is uh, saying maybe coming to Michigan was a mistake. Former Michigan football coach uh, apparently uh, is sort of getting nostalgic, and he says, at the time I was looking to do some things, the opportunity was there, and I made the move, but now it's easy to go back and say, gee, I made a mistake. We had a good thing going at West Virginia. We really enjoyed it, and when you look back, it wasn't the best move, but that's easy to say now. That's what Rich Rodriguez is saying about his situation. By the way, Brady, these guys are all getting nostalgic because Brady Hoke spent part of his weekend observing one of his four former teams. He went down to Muncie, Indiana, and attended the spring game at Ball State and uh, was a team that uh, Brady Hoke, when he was coaching them long before he came here to Michigan, had its best season ever. And uh, so Brady Hoke was getting a little bit nostalgic this weekend, too. We'll talk to Mark D'Antonio, the Michigan State football coach, Coming up uh, a little bit later in the program, he's got the green and white game this weekend. Did you go to church yesterday on Easter Sunday? Well, authorities say a man walked into a Detroit area church, swiped a bag holding thousands of dollars that was collected by the church, and made off with it. It was the uh, Lady of Mount Carmel Roman Catholic Church in Wyandotte. That's where I grew up. My parents were at that mass. Authorities say the man walked into the church, asked to speak with the priest, went through a black hallway, a back hallway, took the money bag, and left. And they're on the look for anyone trying to cash checks made out to the church or cash. And they're going to release a sketch of the dirty scoundrel that went into the place where I was baptized, and the place where I got first communion and confirmation, and swiped a bag of money on Easter Sunday. Can you believe it? Uh, it's Michael Patrick Shields all across the state of Michigan. Glad to have you with us on this Monday morning. Michael Patrick Shields with you all across the state of Michigan and seen on Fox 47 television. Gary uh, Baxter and Kip Boney, the uh, brass at Fox 47, just walked in here to our American Metal Roof studio in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building having a look around. Uh, nice to have you with us this morning, too. Now, imagine my shock when I just read a story from the Associated Press about an Easter Sunday theft. And imagine my shock even further when I find out it's the church at which I was baptized, where I got my first communion, where I was an altar boy, Stations of the Cross, Confirmation, all of it. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Roman Catholic Church in Wyandotte, Michigan, robbed on Easter Sunday. My mother, Gladys Shields, who was married, I think, and also baptized in that church, too, and took her first communion there back when there was a communion rail and all the rest, is on the other end of our line. Good morning to you. Good morning. You hear this news about what happened on Easter Sunday at Mount Carmel? No. What happened? Authorities say a man walked into the church and swiped a bag holding thousands of dollars that was collected by the church. You're kidding me. Nope. Sunday at Mount, Easter Sunday, Mount Carmel, somebody walked into the church, asked to speak with the priest, walked through a back hallway, grabbed the money, and left. 
Oh my gosh, what time was that? I don't know, but I know you were at mass. Do you know yes. where do you know where dad was at the time? Did you have your eyes on him through the entire thing? <laughs> no, he was next to me all the time. Cuz he was an usher and he knows how the system works. You know what oh I'm saying? Oh my gosh. Police are no. on the, <laughs> Police are on the lookout for anybody who are who might be trying to cash checks made out to the church. You know, or they're looking for the cash, and they're going to release a sketch of the man. But I presume he went up and said, can I see Father Wally? And uh, they let him in the back, and he grabbed the cash and made a cash grab and run. Where did you hear this? <laughs> I'm not making it up. This is not a practical joke. This is re being reported by the Associated Press. You can find it at uh, freep.com if you look in the free press. Oh, my God. Quite the scandal. No, because huh? we were there at... From 7.30 till quarter after 9, I didn't see anything going on. Well, that would be the big cash uh, service, too, wouldn't it? Because that was the resurrection yeah. mass, so that would be the most crowded, and presumably the take would be the biggest. But it doesn't say yeah. here how much. Just that he grabbed a bag, thousands of dollars, they think, was in it, and it made and went running. Well, uh, Lori was at uh, 12 o'clock, and she said it was really crowded there. Oh, so it could have been then, too. You know, I remember when I was young, uh, there was one occasion where that church was robbed again. Do you remember, you know, where you light the candles? They had these, like, a depository where you put dollar bills and coins. Oh, and yes. I got there to serve Mass. I think it was seven, it must have been 630 Mass because I was an altar boy. And somebody had gotten into the church and drilled through the wall, a hole in the wall next to the uh, depository, and took all oh, the money God. out. Yeah, so highway robbery right there in, oh. in, on Easter Sunday of all times. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have to uh, go online and uh, look at the free press. I'm giving it to you right here. That's all they have right at the moment. Oh, anyway, my gosh. There you Maybe have it'll it. be on uh, the news, the local news, too. Maybe it could be national news because when you rob a church on Easter Sunday, that's pretty sensational. Sensational oh stuff. Hey, let me ask you something. Uh, you have a cottage at Sage Lake, and you live in the Down River part of the state of Michigan. Gas prices yes. now averaging $388 a gallon, 12 cents higher than two weeks ago. Is that oh. going to change your habits of driving up north for the weekend? Will you think more about that now because of the gas prices? Yes, I guess when we'll go there, we're not going to come back. <laughs> well, why would you want to? It's a beautiful place right on the lake. And, I know, uh, you can I stand. know. I, know I, I don't think there'll be too many just going on weekends like there used to be. And, and, and will that affect how, how you, much you use the pontoon boat? No, because uh, that... That you know doesn't use that much gas. Okay, I'm now I'm just putting two and two together here. If you you want more money for gas, you were at Mount Carmel on Sunday. The bag no. disappeared from the back. <laughs> you How could sure? you ever think that? All right. Well, anyway, that's shocking news this morning. I thought yes. I would wake you up with yes. that. So thank, thank you for All telling right. me that. Happy Easter. Happy Easter to you, too. Sorry we missed you yesterday. Yeah, well, hey, the gas prices, a trip to wind up, cost know, more than it used I to. I can fly to Bermuda cheaper, I think. Anyway, tell me about that. Let yeah. me know. Call over to Mount Carmel. Call all your uh, people there in Wyandotte and see what you can find out, would you? Yes. Yes, I will. I will. Because they're going to release a sketch at some stage, and who knows? Oh, my gosh. Thank could, you so much for telling me it that. It could be someone we know in Wyandotte when that sketch comes out, 25 minutes after. Robbed on Easter right here in Michigan. It's a pure Michigan Monday. Speaking of traveling up north and back and forth, we're going to talk with Gary McCord in the coming days, the CBS golf analyst who will be um, at the Michigan Amateur, which is at Boyne Highlands this year. They're going to have a dinner, and you know he's a pretty good Champions Tour player, too. Gary McCord will join us. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Well, I'm getting pretty good gas mileage on this uh, Hyundai Veracruz, this... Uh, Say, uh, I would say it's sort of a mid-size SUV I'm test driving for Cheryl Freeboro at Hyundai of Lansing. You can get it for only $19,295. It's parked right out in front here of our American Metal Roof Studio in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building. It's uh, suggested Blue Book is higher than that, over $20,000, but you can get it for $19,000. And you can fit seven people in it. Better fuel economy than the Chevy Traverse, the GMC Acadia, and the Buick Enclave. It looks a lot like the Buick Enclave. So I'm test driving it, and if you want it, They'll deliver it to you anywhere in the state of Michigan. That's uh, Hyundai of Lansing with Cheryl Freeboro. Gary Austin uh, looks like Jimmy Carter, the former president, is going to North Korea. Hmm. And he wants to meet with Kim Jong-il. And he's upset about the severe food shortages. And he wants to talk more about uh, nuclear disarmament. You think he'll be successful? I don't know. Try to get that situation 
sorted out. Uh, others have tried and failed, and Jimmy Carter hoping he has better luck. This update is service of American Metal Roofs. The website, AmericanMetalRoofs.com. You'll never have to worry about the weather again with a beautiful, guaranteed American Metal Roof. Well, it was one week ago today, Kalamazoo police officer Eric Zapata was shot and killed in the line of duty and today visitation at Langland Funeral Home in Kalamazoo. Funeral tomorrow on the campus of Western Michigan University inside Miller Auditorium. Zapata was on the police force in Kalamazoo for 10 years. The man who shot him later killed himself. What's next for Florida Pastor Terry Jones is really up in the air now, but he's sounding more and more like he's going to try to protest somewhere sometime soon. He was going to try to do it on Friday outside a mosque in Dearborn, but he was arrested instead. Officers were worried there could be trouble, and they figured better not take any chances for obvious reasons. And Metro Source is reporting he'd still like to protest maybe soon, but this time maybe outside Dearborn City Hall. Jones is the one who got worldwide attention when he said he'd burn a Koran on 9-11. Yeah, Brian Rooney told us earlier he used to be with the Thomas More Law Center. He ran for Congress against uh, Tim Wahlberg for the uh, nomination. He said that it's easier to protest on a public facility hmm. than it is at a private facility like we presume the Islamic Center would be. Yeah, uh, and, and he may try it again. We'll see. Hey, how about some good state budget news for a change? Ten seconds. March income tax collections have been tabbed and come to find out over that time... $500 million was generated more than the experts expected. Hey, that's like finding a $20 bill in your laundry. Terrific. It's Michael Patrick Shield. Well, we have a new number one player uh, in the world, and it was um, Luke Donald here stateside at Harbortown at the Hilton Head Tournament, the Heritage Classic. He was hoping to become the new number one player in the world and uh, went to a playoff against Brent Snedeker. And uh, on the third playoff hole, lost to Brant Snedeker, who puts on that uh, tartan jacket that they give for winning the Heritage Classic. Probably for the last time, there is no sponsorship left for that uh, storied venue. You know, the one with the big red and white uh, lighthouse behind the 18th green there, that Pete Dye design that the players love so much. Probably going to be the last one. So Lee Westwood was playing over in Indonesia, and uh, he won. So uh, Lee Westwood, I think, was the Indonesian Masters. Lee Westwood, the Englishman, is now number one. He supplants the German Martin Keimer atop the uh, world rankings. So congratulations to Brant Snedeker. We will be broadcasting live from the World Golf Hall of Fame inductions with Jim Nance from CBS. Dan Hicks from NBC will be with us. President George Bush, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, will be put into the Hall of Fame along with Ernie Els, who will join us on the program. And uh, Jock Hutchison will be inducted. Frank Cherkinian, the CBS director, will be inducted, and uh, also Doug Ford, who won the Masters, will be there. The World of Golf will be with us, and you will be too, uh, just in about, uh, what's well, two weeks from today, Monday and Tuesday, and that sets up Players' Championship Week, so-called fifth major there at the TPC Sawgrass with the Island Green. It's 35 minutes after the hour. Glenn Meesh is with us, the new general manager of Garland Resort. You remember Garland Resort in Lewiston? One of the first really posh northern Michigan golf resorts. And uh, Ron Otto, who was, I think, was uh, an auto parts dealer in the Detroit area, an industrialist of some sort, wanted an escape for his family, and he came up with this resort, and uh, they just made it beautiful. Deep in the woods there near Lewiston with the big log lodge. And now new owners and new management. Glenn, good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Not too bad. Garland was the bell of the ball at one time and then sort of maybe moved into a secondary position to some of the other high-profile resorts. Where does it stand now, and where are you going? It's going to go back to the bell of the ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I've been at Garland now for six weeks, uh, moved up from Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, we are under new ownership. We have been under ownership since uh, August of 2009. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new ownership is New Frontiers Capital, which is based out of Auburn Hills. And uh, they have uh, put in multi-million dollars worth of renovation. If, if you haven't been here uh, in over a year and a half, uh, I, I would dare say you probably wouldn't even recognize the uh, property since the improvements have occurred. You're kidding. What would I notice first? Uh, the lodge. You know how beautiful the lodge. It's, it's yeah. uh, the largest log structure east of the Mississippi. And as you come in, you know, many of the trees have been taken down so that you can, you can see the lodge mm -hmm. as, you, as you come in the entrance. 
but on the inside, all of the lobby, the restaurant, the lounge, everything has been totally renovated with more windows, more light. It's it's really spectacular. Mm. You always had a good nightlife in there, I thought, didn't you? Yes, the nightlife is uh, is is always going to be good at Garland, and as we begin to kick off the season on April 29th, this Friday will be our first weekend of opening. Uh, we'll go right back into the daytime as well as the, the nightlife. And people who can come to Garland, you know, we want couples, we want uh, golfers, but we also want people who can come up and enjoy the outdoors. And with the gasoline prices the way they are now, the one good thing about uh, Garland is you can come up and it's self-contained. Yes. So you can park your car and you can enjoy as much time as you want and never really get back in the car again. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you didn't mind giving up the oppressive heat of Arizona to come to northern Michigan? <laughs> well, actually, uh, it, was, it was very interesting because it was just getting into the oppressive side so now we came up into the all of the snow and uh, i'm originally from syracuse new york and my wife's from medicine hat alberta so it's not like we're not used to the snow okay i got gotcha. you but still we would like to get rid of the april showers and bring on the may flowers because it's been a long winter here in michigan absolutely and actually uh i had a small uh, bet with our director of grounds whether uh, the snow would be totally gone by yesterday or today, and I believe I'm going to win that small bet because there's a little, little bit of snow left in the parking lot, but all <laughs> the golf courses are completely uh, clear. And actually, we came out smelling very, very good from all of the uh, tough winter we had here. Are uh, couples and um, is that your niche, really? It's kind of a romantic golf resort, if there can be such a thing. You know, I think what happened, Michael, is we, we ended up going from what you said, the posh property, to where we had uh, the majority of our uh, golfers were, were males who came up, and, and they still will be. They, they love to come up in groups. But one of the misunderstood, uh, I think, uh, perceptions of, of Garland is it is a very, very romantic property. Mm -hmm. And to be able to come up and enjoy golf, we do have spa services here, but also we have totally redone our food and beverage. So the, the food and beverage now being served from this point forward is going to be a, a five-diamond uh, caliber, and we're very, very excited about that. So you, get, again, can come. You can walk. You can bike. You can do pretty much anything you want if you like the outdoors. What would your uh, price point be for 18 holes average? Uh, right now, going into the spring, uh, if you want, if you were a hotel guest, you're going to pay forty dollars Monday through Thursday, mm -hmm. and then fifty dollars Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and holiday. Fifty dollars for eighteen holes with a cart. Yes, fifty dollars. Well, you've people. certainly made it affordable. I mean, for a big time resort like that. Yeah, and you know, all of the, the three of the four uh, uh, golf courses have been renovated: new cart paths, uh, new sand traps. Uh, the landscaping has been really totally redone. So again, it's uh, I, I walk out on the golf course every day, and and it's amazing uh, uh, the beauty that's up here, as well as water. I mean, Swamp Fire, for instance, of the 18 holes, 16 holes are, are with water. So if you want a challenge, uh, the four golf courses at Garling can provide a different challenge to, no matter what course you're playing. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you for the investment in Pure Michigan, and we wish you all the good luck, and we'll see you up there sometime. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that's Glenn Mee. She's the new general manager at Garland Resort, having come, as you heard, from um, Phoenix, uh, originally from Canada, though, and uh, we wish them the best there. It is a uh, Pure Michigan Monday here in the American Metal Roof Studio in the Gillespie Group Stadium District building. Uh, a man with a knife tried to hijack an Alitalia flight from Paris to Rome that happened while you slept last night. He wanted to go to Libya. It was a, it was a hijacking. He was overpowered, though, and arrested when the plane landed. Uh, basically, he had a knife, or maybe it was some sort of nail clipper. And he uh, held it to the throat of a flight attendant for a few minutes, but they immobilized him, and everything went on as usual. They, don't, uh, they haven't identified him yet. 48-year-old citizen of Kazakhstan who worked in Paris is what we're understanding. All 131 passengers on the plane safely disembarked in Rome and went straight for a glass of wine, I would think.
Michigan State football coach Mark D'Antonio on spring practice and the upcoming spring game this weekend. When we get back, it's Michael Patrick Shields. Michigan State's uh, spring game, the football game anyway, is this weekend, Saturday, 1.30 at Spartan Stadium. The uh, tickets are free, and it will be on the Big Ten Network as well. Uh, they conclude 15 spring practices under the fifth-year head coach Mark D'Antonio, green and white intra-squad game, and uh, parking in the lots uh, is free as well, so that should be a lot of fun. And they're going to have a free youth clinic, uh, no registration required for children from 8 through 12. <clears throat> and that'll be from 10 to 11.30 on the practice fields behind the Duffy Doherty football building. That's uh, where they uh, normally practice. Be kind of fun to take your kids there because you get an inside look at where the Spartans work out and practice. Nobody usually gets to see that. Uh, you can buy a press box seat if you want. Another thing you don't normally get to do, there are 100 of them and they're $50 each. And the innovative Michigan State Spartan Nation, once again, welcoming you in the uh, <clears throat> way that they do. They, you can celebrate, too, Michigan State women's golf because the women's golf team won the Big Ten Championship this weekend on Easter Sunday in uh, Illinois. Uh, they beat uh, Purdue uh, in second place there. And so Stacy Slobodnik, uh, Michigan State hasn't had a championship since 2007, and she'll join us a little bit later this morning. Congratulations to the Spartans, uh, 46 minutes after the hour. There is a, uh, well, let me just tell you first off, this uh, royal wedding is getting a lot of attention. And the royal wedding is this Friday, and it will happen while we're on the air in the morning. So we'll have live coverage for you. We'll be dipping in, in and out of the uh, audio coming out of London, and I'll be in Bermuda, so uh, part of the British Commonwealth, and I'll be telling you how the Bermudians are celebrating. You're going to have to get up early and set an alarm if you're going to do it. Uh, because uh, that's all going to roll out about 10 in the morning London time, which will be much earlier here within 6 and 7 o'clock hour. But how fascinated are you with the nuptials of Prince William and Kate Middleton? According to the New York Times poll, not very interested. Only 6% have been following the news about the wedding very closely, and 22% are following it somewhat closely. That's all. Women paying much more attention than men, particularly older women is uh, what we understand the people who are really into the royal wedding but nevertheless it will be one of the biggest worldwide audiences for a television event in history and madonna's ex-husband guy Ritchie will be on the guest list victoria beckham you know posh spice and her husband david beckham the soccer king mr bean will be there rowan atkinson sir elton john will be there you'll see all sorts of people you know but you won't see the Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, who's been kind of an embarrassment since she royal married into and got divorced from the, uh, the royal family. The King of Tonga will be there. The King of Swaziland. The Queen of Spain. The Governors General of Canada and Jamaica will be there. The Prime Ministers of the Bahamas and Australia. But I'm told Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister, not invited. Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, not invited. And uh, the Obamas, not invited invited. Isn't that interesting? Uh, 48 minutes now after the hour. We never let the birthday of a beautiful woman pass without taking note. Talia Shire is 65. She was Connie in The Godfather, Michael's sister. And of course, she was Yo Adrian in the Rocky movies. Jane Clayson is 44. She was host of The Early Show. And uh, Renee Zellweger, who has been in Michigan making movies. Uh, she did Cold Mountain and Jerry Maguire and Nurse Betty and Bridget Jones' Diary. Uh, is uh, how old is uh, she? So, 42. Happy birthday, darlings, to you. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Why won't Barack Obama release his birth certificate? Donald Trump's been asking it. Maybe you've been asking it. Now there's a state senator from Hawaii. That's uh, Senator Sam Slom, and he thinks he knows the reason. He told WABC uh, that he thinks the president has something to hide because why wouldn't he show it otherwise? He says the real issue stopping Barack Obama from releasing his long form birth certificate instead of just the certificate of live birth is to hide the name of his actual birth father. He says he thinks Obama was born in Hawaii, but the real issue is what's on the birth certificate. It could have to do with what his name is on the certificate and who his father is. Is that unpleasant to talk about that? Well, that state senator doesn't seem to mind talking about it very much. Um, <clears throat> do you believe in God? There was a poll, 18,829. That's a big sample. 
18,000 people, almost 19, over 23 countries were polled. 51% said they're convinced there's an afterlife. 18% said no way, there is no God, and 17% were undecided. The countries that were the most devout, the most definitive belief in God, Indonesia, Turkey, and Brazil. Now, two of those countries are Muslim, are they not? There's the, uh, that's the update for you there as we get through the uh, Easter season and who believes in God. Um, boy, oh boy, Michigan State University is in the news a lot this morning. Kyle Martin is riding his bike from California all the way to Charleston, South Carolina. He wants to raise money for Haiti. He's hoping to raise $50,000 for a medical clinic in Haiti. And uh, how would you like to do this? It's a 3,000-mile trip. And he was in the Colorado Rockies. He was riding up at 10,200 feet through Lizard Head Pass. I want to know how you get up to 10,200 feet on a bike, because that cannot be easy. So we're going to touch base with him along the way there. They're looking for donations, and they're looking for places that he can stay along the way so it's a little more affordable, and they can raise more money for the charity. But congratulations to them. Wall Street back in action after a three-day holiday. Earnings reports expected to be released by 180 blue-chip companies. So this could be a big week for the market. All three major indices closed higher last week. The Dow was up 1.5%, uh, the NASDAQ 2%, and the S&P up 1.3%. It was the first higher week of trading in almost a month. And let's hope that's a positive trend. We're going to get you the full sports story, what's going on. And uh, perhaps we'll talk with Mark D'Antonio. He's uh, due to call us any moment. So stay tuned. It's Michael Patrick Shields all across Michigan. Well, when we talked to uh, Lynn Henning and uh, we talked to Dan Dickerson about the Tigers, they all said, yeah, we won't know what kind of team we have till we're about 100 games in. And let's hope this weekend was an indication that things are turning around for the Detroit Tigers. Rich Kincaid was at Comerica Park. Rich? Max Scherzer, the story for the Tigers yesterday, Michael Patrick, as Detroit completed a three-game weekend sweep of the Chicago White Sox with their second consecutive shutout 3-0 over the White Sox, Scherzer working eight innings of four-hit ball. The Tigers, since they started the season 3-7, and seven, there was great wailing and gnashing of teeth as they were at that point on pace to lose 113 games. And I know I was one of the people doing the gnashing and the wailing. They've really turned yeah. things around. Great. Since that start, the Tigers have gone 8-3. and three. In the weekend series against Chicago, the Tigers outscored the White Sox 21-3. to three. They're on a roll right now. They're off today. They open a three-game series against Seattle at Comerica Park on Tuesday, then a weekend shutdown against the Central Division-leading Cleveland Indians in Cleveland. Yesterday, the Tigers over the White Sox 3-0 at Comerica Park. I'm Rich Kincaid. Back to you, Michael Patrick. All right, the NFL draft coming Thursday and Friday, but will there be a season? We don't know. Uh, one thing we know for sure is the Lions are not talking to any quarterbacks, and they will not draft any quarterbacks, even in the late rounds. Uh, the general manager, Martin Mayhew, said, quote, I'm putting all my eggs in the Matthew Stafford, Sean Hill, Drew Stanton basket. Are you happy with that? I guess we'll wait and see. Uh, the uh, Celtics have eliminated the Knicks in the NBA. The Nashville Predators won their first ever postseason series in franchise history with a 4-2 to win over the Ducks. And uh, Chicago, the Stanley Cup champ, averted being eliminated with a 4-3 to victory over Vancouver. Game 7 tomorrow night in Western Canada. Television viewers, thanks for being with us this morning. Adios and Radio listeners, stay right where you are. Next hour, we'll have more of your Pure Michigan Monday. And if you're watching on television in Lansing, tune to 1240 AM right now to catch us on the radio for the rest of the morning. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Adios and